Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to be revisiting an older piece. This is the Swedish Terminator's painting. Uh, I did this, oh, I don't know, last year, so 2012, I guess. Um, but uh, this was a really fun commission. Uh, this was a 40k themed commission. Uh, it was kind of an interesting one, and it started a slew of other similar commissions, which was people wanted to be painted in portraiture uh, in their favorite sort of sci-fi uh, setting or fantasy setting. So anyway, uh, what I'm doing now, as you can see in the video, is I'm just collecting some reference material. I have a bunch of Space Marines, Terminators, and some of the family portraits and key information that the commissioner wanted included. Right now I'm just doing some quick sketch work. Um, as you can see, there's kind of just some black scribbles on a gray background. I like to use a neutral background when I work, and by neutral I mean a neutrally valued background. So. When I use a gray background, I can use uh, dark uh, shades and tones to help inscribe shadows, and I can use white or lighter tones to do the opposite and create highlights. So this is just the preliminary sketch, uh, just doing a little bit of color blocking, mostly value stuff, but primarily the purpose of this is to get the composition sort of nailed out so that the commissioner can either approve or make revisions. I don't really think this part took too long, and it shouldn't take too long, because a lot of this stuff is going to be revised or changed, so you generally don't want to spend too much time at this uh, part. So, as you can see, I'm still just doing some value work, kind of showing where things are going to go. Um, and apparently I'm rendering it out quite a bit. It's been a while since I've seen this, so I'm going to be a little bit forgetful about what exactly was going on at the time. But uh, right there, I just did a little blending. The way I blend, and I get this question a lot, so please pay attention. The way I blend is I use the standard brush tool and the eyedropper tool. And I just sort of set the opacity like between 20 and 40%. Sample, do a little brush stroke. Sample again, do another brush stroke. And just blend the two colors together, just like making a gradient. So now I'm doing a little bit of actual real polishing here. I'm sort of uh, adding in the color of the uh, Grand Guard. Uh, I was specifically requested that, I believe it was the military unit uh, that the commissioner served in. I think, I could be wrong, but I think that's what was going on. It might have been the Family Crest, I can't remember it to be honest. But uh, <clears throat> that was supposed to be on his Grand Guard. And then, oh no, just kidding. That was the military unit, the shoulder. There we go. The shoulder guard, or the shoulder uh, plate, had the family crest on it, which was the black griffin on a yellow, yellow uh, field. And the way I'm doing that is I'm, I'm just using normal brush, just blocking in the shape, and then going back and shading uh, over top with just normal layers, I believe. Uh, I use standard Photoshop brushes. I'm not using any custom brushes right now. This is just the round brush. And here you can see I'm doing some work on the face. Uh, since this is a portrait, the face actually has to resemble the commissioner very closely. So as you saw from the reference sheet at the beginning, uh, I kind of established some good reference shots. I had the commissioner who was in Sweden send me some photos from his phone and whatnot of uh, himself and his brothers so that I had something to work with. Uh, it was actually sort of funny because I'd be getting these emails in the middle of the day worth yelling Swedish men. Uh, standing in bathrooms using mirrors, so <laughs> a little bit surreal, but uh, it was really fun. So anyway, uh, I knocked in the face here. You can see I'm doing some work on the uh, kind of gorget and hood. And I'm actually mostly just hinting at forms here. So rather than actually paint in a big strip of metal, I'm just sort of painting in the highlights and the shadows so that we get an idea of where it falls without actually going in and doing all of the details by hand. And sometimes suggestive or sort of hinted at details can be a lot more provoking or, uh, I guess, beautiful to look at. They're just sort of more subtle. Uh, this piece did require a lot of polish, and there was a lot of geometry to be done. Uh, Terminator armor uh, is primarily made of these big chunks of 
plate, so I had to be really comfortable doing, uh, you know, cylinders and spheres and cubes and whatnot. And I mean, they're sort of fundamental things that you need to be able to be able to render if you want to be a serious artist. But it's in situations like this one where it becomes painfully clear, where if you can't render these things quickly, easily, and accurately, you are going to have problems. And as you can see, I'm just really working on, I think, three layers right now. Every time I make a lot of progress, I save and compress my layers down. Now I'm working on some lightning claws and the gauntlet. Once again, you can see how I'm using shadow and highlight to hint at forms, uh, such as we have a high specular highlight on the uh, kind of under mesh for the armor in the joints. And there's a nice little shelf on the gauntlet itself, which I'm hinting at with just a couple lines of shadow and highlight. Similarly, weathering is very important. Weathering is, uh, it's, it's not painting clouds and sunshine and whatnot. Uh, weathering is the process of adding age or damage to things. So it's especially poignant on armor or fighting vehicles or really anything that gets a lot of use. Um, so in this case, the the ceramite armor, uh, as you can see, is being weathered. So there's chips of metal showing through where the paint has been scuffed or uh, sort of shorn off by damage or shrapnel or bullets or whatever, or just wear. Um, and that's kind of actually really fun to do. It's it's fairly simple. It's it's really more just an idea rather than a render. Um, so I like doing that quite a bit. Uh, just doing some cleanup work on the face now. And once more, here, uh, if we do a little kind of simple breakdown of what everything is, the gauntlets are really just a, a, a bunch of geometric shapes, right? So we've got cylinders, which are these little pistons, and it's a series of stacked cylinders. We've got some cubes or rectangular prisms, which are the kind of knuckle duster portion and the actual knuckles. And then, you know, the gauntlet itself is really just a squash cylinder. So as long as you can break things down into their composite geometric shapes, it makes life pretty easy when you're rendering. Um, that sort of thought process makes my job a lot easier if I just say, okay, rather than freaking out saying, well, I don't know what a gauntlet renders like, I don't have a reference for that. I say, okay, well, what's it made of? How is the light going to interact with it? Where are the shadows going to fall? How are the highlights going to show? And sometimes that does take a little bit of a thought experiment. Um, I think I'm actually a little bit fortunate in that I was uh, I was able to work with 3D engines and rendering software. Um, part of that has allowed me, I believe anyway, to better assess how light will fall on something. Um, it kind of has enhanced my spatial uh, abilities. So being able to sort of say in, in real time or either with a render engine or whatever, being able to move a light source around an object in a 3D environment and then seeing how the light interacts and how the light works with the object is actually very useful. Um, I know a lot of artists use Maya or 3ds Max or ZBrush or Blender or any of those, you know, or, or what's it called, uh, Google SketchUp, Poser, all those things are very useful for figuring out that sort of stuff. but. I don't always have time necessarily go in and model something. Sometimes it is faster to do that. Um, I, it's not really something I do, just because it's been so long, I'm not really comfortable working in 3D anymore. But you get the idea. Sometimes it's it, it can be nice to have those sort of just rendered out for you as a guide, rather than having to figure it out by yourself. But I kind of like the rendering process and figuring out lighting, so I don't really complain too much about that. All right, so we're still bulking in some of the shapes on this guy. Um, as you can see, I had to make some adjustments. Uh, the commissioner requested some things changed, and it's really easy when you're working digitally to do that. Um, literally, all you have to do is just grab the lasso tool and make some changes. So I, I love working digitally. I cannot recommend it strongly enough. I know there are a lot of traditionalists who think, for some reason, that digital art is not real art, and, I mean, they're just, I don't know, misled, I guess. All right, so got some nice little renders going. 
Uh, same thing with the skull, the Aquila symbol is, uh, you know, how do we render that out? Okay, well, break it down. First off, it's a cylindrical shape because it's wrapped around his torso. So think of how light falls on a cylinder, render that. Now we have to subdivide. We have smaller portions of this shape that need to be rendered in, uh, distinctly. So the skull is mostly a spherical form. It's kind of a dish, uh, an obverse dish. Uh, or a bubble, so we can render it as such. And the rest of the little pieces are really just little rectangular prisms or, you know, little tubes, little cylinders. So it's, it actually is not that difficult once you start breaking things down. Same with the knee pad here. The knee pad is really just a large uh, squashed sphere. Now, it can become complex when you have multiple light sources. In this one, we have a primary or key light, which is just the like sun. Um, we have secondary bounce light, which is the earth. We have third reflective light or bounce light, which is the red armor. Uh, we have reflective light from the golds because gold is highly reflective. So it will show up on the armor itself locally. And then lastly, we have the, uh, the energy weapons or gun flares and all that kind of stuff. Those also cast light. So you can see on the skull here, we have the reflected light of the armor is red. And then we have a kind of blue streak of intense highlight, which is from the lightning claws, which are right above it, and uh, a little bit of underside and primary light as well. All right, so we're just doing some more rendering here. Once again, cylinder, the little hinge on the side of the leg is just a cylinder. Um, if you get confused about doing shapes, uh, the basic way to think of it is there's, there are really sort of two ends of the spectrum. There are, uh, cubes and there are spheres and everything else can sort of be rationalized between the two. So, uh, a cylinder is really just... You know, it, it's it's a sphere that's been distended, so it has two flat tops, and then the sides are all equal. Um, a cone is really just a cylinder that's had its top pinched shut, so the the top plane has become, uh, I guess, zero scaled. It has no scale of its own. It's just a single point rather than a surface. Uh, a rectangular prism is just an extended or squashed cube. And a pyramid is really just either a, it, depending on how many points you have, whether it's a four point or three point pyramid, a four point pyramid is really, it's equivalent to uh, a cylinder, uh, I'm sorry, a, uh, a cone. So just like the cone is a cylinder that's had its top squished, a pyramid is a rectangular prism that's had its top squished. So all of these things are sort of related. Um, and once you start thinking about things in that way, it makes life easier. Uh, so these little uh, adamantium studs are actually fairly easy to do. They're really just circles, uh, which are then rendered to be spheres. So as you can see, they have a top light, they have a bounce from the beneath, and then the middle is where the terminator or the shadow falls. And then beneath them, I just do a little localized shadow where it's casting light on itself. And it looks like I'm starting to do some more weathering. Oh, here are some more studs. These are done the exact same fashion. All these little screws and bolts and nuts and whatnot, they're all just done using little spheres. And once again, you can see I'm doing the knee pads, just quickly knocking out quite sort of a spherical shape, doing a little bit of embellishment, done. Adding some laurels here. And some chains. Now, why am I adding chains? Well, other than making the guy look cool, giving him a little bit of decoration, um, they add a nice sense of dynamism. And what do I mean by that is by having those chains moving so, uh, I guess, violently being you know thrown about, it gives him a sense of motion, a sense of action.
All right, now I'm doing some edging, just some little kind of frogging and whatnot. Uh, what, what I'm doing is I paint in the basic form of the frogging, and then I use a uh, lock layer. So it's that little sort of checkered cube symbol in the layers menu. And that makes sure that I'm not working anywhere but on the pixels that already exist. So I use that a lot when I have to do kind of uh, frogging or filigree. It's a really quick tool for giving nice and easy highlights and shadows to something which are, is otherwise very difficult to do by hand. Um, also when I do filigree and frogging and whatnot, I find that just using drop shadows and bevel and emboss layer effects can actually be really useful. There's sort of these cheesy layer effects that don't get used very much, but in a pinch, they're pretty respectable. I actually really like using them for, uh, for that sort of effect. Now what you saw just there was I just copied that part of the painting and duplicated it and then rescaled it uh, just to get a matching pair of lightning claws. There's really no point in painting it freehand. It's just a waste of time, especially when they have to be so similar anyway. So all I do is I copied it, pasted it, and then rendered out the bottom. So it's the reverse of the, uh, his, his right arm becomes his left. At this stage, I was fooling around with some smokestacks that had some uh, uh, ventilation holes drilled into them. I don't know how long those lasted for. I don't think I kept them that long. They were kind of cool at first, but I just, I don't know, they looked sort of too steampunky. They weren't really gothic grim dark enough for me so those don't last too long but there were some cool stuff that went into them so here i'm doing kind of this underlit smoke sort of representing this billowing fire that's coming out from these smokestacks um and that was actually accomplished pretty easily just you know some kind of warm orange highlighted with a little bit more lighter warm orange and then eventually some yellows and maybe you know some kind of very light yellows uh and you can see how it sort of resembles these underlit clouds now Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Alright, just throwing a scabbard in there for a sidearm, just a sword. Um, Pretty much just done in silhouette with some blocking done to it. Really nothing too complex. A little bit of highlight and shadow and some detail work, but really I didn't spend too much time on the sword. Didn't have to. Now one thing I want to talk about is contrast between foreground and background or different planes within a painting. What I just, or what I'm doing now is I'm sort of blocking out the background and adding some silhouettes. Uh, in order for something to read well, or in order for it to be sort of visible uh, within a painting, it's important to uh, do this sort of thing where you, uh, you know, you, you kind of can differentiate the foreground and the background based on value. Uh, the eye is very good at seeing contrast, and as I've talked about in my other videos, there are multiple forms of contrast. There's bright and dark, saturated and desaturated, warm and cool, uh, detailed and kind of bland so there's there are all these different types of contrast but um foreground and background is really generally done with bright and dark uh you can also do it with kind of blurry and detailed or warm and cool but uh i always find sort of the primary thing to be or at least one of the primary elements to be bright and dark so if you have dark foreground elements, you have to have a bright background and vice versa, otherwise it won't read. If you have a dark foreground and a dark background, you're not going to be able to tell what anything is. And here I'm just sort of adding some details to the bottom of these lightning claws. Doing some further etching and highlights and shadows on these uh, gauntlets. And uh, when in doubt, add skulls if you're doing 40k art. 
when I was working for Fancy Flight Games, that was something that never failed me. Adding skulls is always appreciated and always well received. So, <laughs> adding pretty seals, skulls, and filigree. Those are the three things that always art directors love to see. At least if you're doing 40k. Uh, for War Machine, it's quite different. We we look for different aesthetics. But uh, once again, this is an older piece. This is something I did last year. I think it was kind of around December of last year, maybe. I don't remember exactly. Alright, so here I'm knocking in the face of the younger brother. Uh, the painting was commissioned by the central brother, who I think is the middle brother. The one on the right is the younger, and the one on the left will be the older. And it's sort of funny is I'm using the color picker to go between the two faces to make sure they're consistent. Um, if I was doing traditional painting, I'd have to keep a palette available and sort of mark off what was what. It'd be a lot more difficult, but since we're working digitally, we have no reason to handicap ourselves. We can easily do it just using the uh, eyedropper tool. So I've sort of developed a style of where I block things in and then I'll chop out things that I don't like. So in this case, you can see I'm sort of doing the edges with just filling the background in around them, cutting into the actual form. And then I'll block in a large chunk of shadow or highlight and sort of take it from there and render it one way or the other. And that's sort of the technique I've developed over the years. Um, it's very quick and generally it yields very good results. Uh, as long as you have a kind of strong sketch or composition behind it to work from, you're gonna turn out all right. So here I am sketching in the griffin. I don't even know how many times I've painted griffins because it's my, it's my family crest as well, so um, I use it quite often when I do sort of themed artwork. But, uh, yep, these guys wanted their own uh, Griffin Crest done, so I was happy to oblige. Here I go, I'm uh, messing with the smokestacks once more. It's amazing what the lasso tool can really accomplish. And just painting in the details. When you use the lasso tool, you have to kind of deal with the fallout after. It's not a perfect tool, it won't get exactly what you want primarily because you probably haven't painted exactly what you wanted, so some of those details that you imagine being there aren't really there. So once you are finished working with the lasso and the transform tool and all that fun stuff, you always have to go back in and touch it up and make sure that you don't have some really awkward cutoffs or selections hanging out. Those are called artifacts, by the way. Things that are left over from tool processes or renders or whatever are called artifacts. And not in the fun dungeon crawling way of, I found an artifact. It's like, oh, crap, we got artifacts all over the place. So originally this guy was going to have a power sword and storm bolter, but we went big, so that's not going to last. And once again, I'm just doing some really quick metal work here. As you can see, the hood is really just a cross-section of a cylinder or a sphere. So I treat it as such, and I don't have to overthink it that way. So you can see how I sort of move my highlight along to help distinguish the shape. Because the highlights, it's the it's shadows, light shadows that uh, light and shadows that really determine forms of objects more than anything else. So being able to master those is very very helpful. Um, just being able to hint at things and their their dimensions and their volumes with light and shadow is extremely useful. And lots of little skulls, because why not? 
that actually has something to do with complexity and contrast, if you think about it. So the armor is red and fairly open. There are some little details on it, and there are some weathering elements. But really, it's mostly blank surfaces. So the rest of the armor and the design need to be a little bit more complex, which is why we have all the filigree and the skulls and the nuts and bolts and the chains and whatnot. It, those help provide contrast visually for the armor's sort of simplified blocky design. Here's a fun trick using layer masks. That's how I get perfectly regular cuts into the uh, the gorget there. All I did was I made a kind of shadowy crescent and then using the layer mask I can just chop out sections I don't like. And that way I still have the information if I mess up I can just paint it back in. So when in doubt bring an assault cannon. Don't bring a storm bolter. So I, uh, <laughs> I added an assault cannon to this guy and there's the ammo hopper in the back. I'm just sort of roughing in the silhouette. And uh, I don't believe us people with assault cannons can carry power swords, so I gave him a power fist instead. I think visually power fists are one of the coolest things in Warhammer 40k. They're just this giant sort of, uh, uh, what's it called, fiddler crab style armor. It's just like, wow, one arm is massive. So I like that aesthetic. I like, and that's that's another element of contrast, right? You've got the small arm, and you've got this oversized, gigantic arm on the other side. It's like, whoa, what's going on here? All right, so I'm just doing more highlights. You can see I'm doing kind of uh, once again. It's it's really just cylinders. The arm segments are just simple cylinders. You can see the primary highlight, uh, sort of the fade of the light, and then the terminator. And then here we don't really have a bounce so much because it's not really reflecting off anything. There's just sort of a uh, occlusive shadow, but um, normally there would be a bounce coming from underneath. It's like there on the uh, Power Fist gauntlet. You can see there's a bounce. The Terminator falls sort of three quarters of the way over. The Terminator, by the way, for those who aren't familiar with the term, is the darkest part of a shadow. It's the part where direct light stops hitting an object. So in a sphere, if you imagine uh, a light being shined on it, it's the part where the rays of light are no longer able to directly hit the surface. Alrighty, more fun stuff. That looks like I gave actually a little bit of a bounce, and you can see there's a little bit of a highlight from the lightning claw being shined on the uh, arm. One thing I try to keep very aware of is where highlights are coming from and where they might fall. Uh, I, I, I take that very seriously, trying to figure out where all the atmospheric and bounce and different uh, different light sources might be coming from. very much like a 3D rendering program. So here, same thing. This is a metal band. It's cylindrical. So we have a primary highlight, a little bit of a fade. Here we have a hint of red, which is the his neighboring Terminator's armor. We have the Terminator, which is the darkest part. And then we have a little bit of bounce from underneath. Also, when rendering metal, um, it can be really useful to think of metal as a mirror rather than just a ordinary object. So, I'm sure all of you have sort of seen that stylized chrome where it's uh, sort of blue, then fades to white, then brown. And that's actually a reflective thing. So that's sort of like a generalized, car almost caricature of what a horizon looks like. So we've got the blue of the sky which fades down to a white, which is the horizon line, and then the brown, which is the earth starts. So the same thing goes for any metal. It just really depends on what degree of reflectivity you want to assign it. So chrome is the most reflective metal. It's essentially a mirror, like highly polished chrome. Um, and, uh, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, you might sort of get like a dull lead or something, which is really not reflective at all. So metals can fall into any range of reflectivity, really gold or polished, uh, burnished brass tend to be very reflective. 
uh, steel is not that reflective. Um, it might take on some sort of loose uh, shadows or highlights from light sources, but it's really, um, it's really not that reflective. All right, time for some fun stuff. So I'm creating barrels, and the way I did that was I created a rectangular uh, form, then using a gradient, using the same technique from the, uh, the cylinders I already painted, I, uh, I just applied it, and then I cropped them in using layer masks to fit the configuration. It's a assault cannon, so it's sort of a rotating cylindrical cannon with multiple barrels, I think it's six. So uh, yeah, it's just six identical barrels with identical highlights, position differently and given localized shadows. What I'm doing right now is I just gave it uh, a little bit of a uh, heat distortion. So the way heat distortion works is when metal is heated up consistently to very high temperatures, uh, it tends to discolor. Um, I'm sorry, not heat, heat distortion, heat discoloration, excuse me. So you can see this a lot on sort of exhaust for trucks or motorcycle mufflers or anything like that. Um, sometimes the barrels of guns will have it. In this case, you can see the assault cannon sort of fades from purple to blue to brown to yellow. Um, and that's the general pattern of heat discoloration. And it's very slight. It's not, you know, on a chrome surface it's more distinct, but on something like this sort of bolt gun color, this dark metal, it's really not going to be that visible. Uh, right now I'm painting the Crux Terminatus, which is the sacred emblem of Terminators. It's supposedly, according to Fluff, contains a small shard of the Emperor's armor on the day he fought Horus. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, just Google Emperor, Horus, etc., and you'll find out all about it. But anyway, um, it's sort of this iron cross shape um, with these little ribs on the inside, and uh, it can be a pain to paint because regular geometric objects can be difficult to paint from different angles if you're not practiced. And irregularly shaped geometric objects are really hard to paint from lots of angles, so fun stuff. Here I'm sort of hinting at the uh, Aquila on his chest once more, just doing some highlights and some studs or skulls. A really easy way to do a skull is to make it sort of look like a bolt or a screw, like a machine screw, a, a flathead screw. Um, the primary distinguishing features of a skull are really normally the eye line, that's the biggest recess in the skull, and then the two little uh, cutaways where the jaw usually fits in. So if you need to kind of do a little skull, you can get away with doing a line down the middle and then the two little cutaways at the edge for the jaw. Um, that will generally impart the form of a skull to someone who is seeing it at a distance or you know doesn't have access to all the details. And you can even see now that I'm doing this sort of other skull form, those are the primary features I'm concerned about. It's sort of this T shape. So, some more work going on. I chose a pretty simple foreground, um, just sort of the earth they were charging at, or charging on. Uh, in this case, I was thinking of like a gray slate type of deal. Uh, here I'm just doing the sort of winged skull motif that's common to space marines. And, uh, or laureled skull, I mean, either way, it's sort of the same sort of deal. But, uh, yeah, I always keep a skull on my desk for reference, just in case um, I need to review it. Now, a lot of the stuff I'm doing right now is really hard to see because it's very slight. Um, I'm painting things which are within shadow, so they're really only getting bounce light. They're not getting the primary light anymore, which is why they're so hard to make out. Just a quick reposition using the lasso tool. 
Nice and easy. A little warp tool there. And once more, doing some cylinders for the leg joints. A little bit of a uh, light there between the legs to show uh, the silhouette. And I apologize if there's any video artifacts. I think this video was just so large. I think it was a 23 hour painting that there were some issues with recording. So if there's any sort of weird video distortion going on, that's why I'm aware of it. I just don't have anything I can really do about it. And time for some sort of shattered rock or shale. Once again, more sort of uh, nubs of adamantium there. Really quick, once again, just spherical shapes. Highlight, terminator, bounce. Oops. At one point, my computer actually started crapping out on me. This image was so large. I think it was like 36 inches or something. 300 dpi. It was a big image. Oh, yay. We get to start on the other brother. So this is the older brother. He was wielding a thunder hammer and storm shield. Um, so I'm just sort of blocking in the forms of the face here. Just the general highlights and some shadows. I actually kind of enjoy doing faces now. Originally I used to dread doing faces, but I sort of really like doing them now. Especially if I have good reference. He's got kind of an intense face in this painting, He's sort of charging and yelling, or kind of gritting his teeth. And I cannot stress how important having good references when doing faces. There's so many, I mean, human beings are very good at finding faces and sort of discerning whether they look correct or not. So even the most untrained eye can tell if a face looks right. Uh, and having that reference material just sort of gives you the edge that you need to make sure it renders correctly. Nice uh, smooth transition there on the shoulder pad. Just a spherical shape, some smooth blending going on. Now you can see inside there's sort of this nice highlight or shadow coming from the uh, gorget. The way I do that is I just sort of imagine the gorget as a uh, 
concave dish and I paint it as so. So the light source will be at the bottom, or the highlight will be at the bottom, since the light source is shining down on it, and the top part will be mostly in shadow. It's actually kind of striking to me to see the process for this video. I haven't watched it in a long time, and I, I forgot how much work went into this piece. <laughs> um, on pieces like this, especially one with three figures, there's a lot of work. Um, you know, if it had been just one figure, we would have been done already. But since there's three, we have to go through and we have to get the faces and all the armor designs and everything polished to the right extent and make sure they all agree with each other in terms of scale and color and lighting. Um, so there's a, just a lot more work to do. What's sort of funny is I, I imagine that painting figures is sort of similar to having kids, where it's, you know, one is hard, two is really hard, three is really hard. But then after that point, it's sort of like, well, I have so many of them that I can just sort of block them in, <laughs> have them take care of each other, if you will. So once you start getting into kind of like crazy battle scenes, you don't really have to spend that much time on each figure. You can sort of just hint that there's a figure there, like get the head and maybe the arms in and a little couple details of the torso and bam you know the rest of him is obscured by another figure so doing art is sort of interesting because when you have a simple or a limited uh, piece you have to sort of go really nuts on the stuff that's there but once it starts getting crazy and complex that's not really such an issue anymore um, a lot of that stuff just sort of works itself out by by itself So he's got a nice big thunder hammer. Oh, this is something that kills me when people... So a lot of times people paint hammers and axes, especially, uh, in poor perspective. What I mean by that is they don't think about how it's being held and how it's falling in space based on where it's being gripped. Um, it just really bugs me. <laughs> like, a really classic example of this is where you see someone holding a spear pointed at you, kind of. So their hand is tilted towards you, but then the spear, the head of the spear is tilted away because they lost track of the perspective. That kind of stuff really bothers me. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's probably for the best. <laughs> But anyway, I'm just doing some details on this here and adding some scratches and nicks to it. And the way I do those nicks and scrapes is I just do a kind of a dark line, which is the shadow. It's the ambient occlusion. And then I do a little highlight line underneath. And that's all it is. Those scrapes and dents are, that's really all it is. It's just a, a shadow with a highlight underneath. Just a little uh, under or overhang. Now this shield is actually kind of difficult. Um, the lighting was kind of hard to figure out here. The legs on the, hand, on the other hand were fairly simple, it's just the same sort of cylinder technique. And you'll see it in a second, I'm sure. At the moment I'm just cleaning up the background. Once again, adding chains for dynamic motion. Now the, uh, the knee pad is in shadow because it's facing away from the light source. The thigh is in the light source, so that's why it's highlighted normally. But the shin and the knee pad have to be lit using bounce light because the primary light source is not actually hitting them. Or at least not from an angle we can see. Which is challenging. It's a little bit more challenging than if it was just normally lit. And then the rear leg is primarily in shadow because it's just underneath the guy and he's casting a shadow upon himself. So here you can see me doing uh, shadow and highlight work on the shield to help define its volume. And now I'm just doing uh, the griffin crest. And that's just a normal layer, just kind of sketched it out loosely and then filled in the rest.
And yes, reference is important. I'm using a reference of the actual crest when I do this. I'm not just sort of conjuring it out of my head. Otherwise, the three griffins that are shown would not look the same, and that would be bad. And here we go, more highlight. Looks like we're rendering out the gorget to be gold rather than just ceramite. And I'm adding some details to the armor here. There's a lot of details in the armor and rescaling going on. Um, sometimes your initial sketch, while looking solid, once you start rendering, you may realize it's not quite as solid as you believed. And it's important to go back and fix those things. Here I'm uh, providing the Grand Guard, which I believe was the symbol for his military unit that he served in, in real life. It's the uh, kind of ram with a banner. And adding another shoulder pad, or the paint on the shoulder pad anyway. And there's a hint of the griffin on the other side. And here I'm painting in the Crux Terminatus, which is, I'm, um, you know, the, the cruciform shape we talked about already. I'm just sort of blocking it in quickly. And then I'll deal with the highlights after. Highlights and the shadows after. So you can see I'm just throwing in some shadows and a little bit of highlight. And done. Adding the Aquila to his chest as well, same way as I did the others. And I'm using normal layers still. As you can see from my history, I'm just using the brush tool. And it looks like I'm working at about a 55% opacity. 44 now. So yeah, my opacity, I don't use like a set opacity. I get, I get a lot of questions about this, like what's the correct opacity you use? Why do you use this opacity? And it's really just whatever fits the situation. So if I need to make a thicker, more opaque line, I'll use a higher opacity. If I want to do something more subtly, I'll use a lower opacity. That's it. There's no, you know, there's no like magic number or ideal number to be using. I tend to use like when I do line or art, I tend to do 35% and then I'll do like 44 for heavy line. And when I do shading, I'll do about 10 or 20, but that's just because I find it works. Um, there's no hard and fast rule. Some more weathering going on. Gotta love weathering. And time for some fun with the background. So, I think it was requested. I could be wrong. It might not have actually been requested, but these guys ended up being on a Necron Tomb World, which is sort of an interesting, uh, interesting environment. I think I've done one of these before when I did that Necron painting. But it had been a while, so... Now, remember when I was talking about contrast? Talking about background and foreground contrast? That's what I'm really kind of calculating right now as I work on it, as you can see. So, because I have this big dark shape in the background, it can't compete with the foreground dudes. So what I did was I threw smoke between the two. 
Also, the, for, uh, the background darkness is not as dark as the foreground dark. The absolute darkest part of the foreground is far darker than the absolute darkest part of the uh, midground. Or background, in this case. And once again, these are done with normal layers. And it looks like I'm using about a 30% brush, I guess. Doesn't really matter. But it's kind of fun what you can do just using um, values and kind of shapes. I've got this giant megalithic stone. And really all I'm doing is defining it using dark and light. Here I'm adding some kind of shattered stone being thrown up in the air. This is similar to the chain that I was talking about earlier. It adds dynamism, it adds motion. It uh, makes the piece less static and more interesting to look at. So it really looks like that foot is smashing down into the ground now. And the, you know, the shale fragments are being thrown up in the air by the force of the impact. Like these guys are really hauling it. And purity seals. So purity seals are really fun to do. Um, the way I do them is I sort of just block in a big form. I use a layer mask to knock out anything I don't want. So in this case, I'm tattering them and sort of refining their shapes. And then lastly, I will use, or not lastly, lastly, but close to last, I will use a layer lock to help uh, shade them. And what the layer lock does is it lets me kind of do these big strokes of shadow and highlight without having to worry about missing or going out of the kind of the, the boundaries of the uh, cloth or the purity seal because once again a locked pixel layer can only affect the pixels that have already been laid down anything else is just not going to be affected so I find it very useful for uh, doing paper thin or parchment uh, things here's some purity seals which are just wax so they're red blotch given some highlights and shadow. They just have a little bit of a, a lip because they're uh, impressed wax, they're sealed. So the top will have a highlight and then the bottom where the bottom lip is will have a highlight. And then underneath the top highlight there'll be a shadow and then underneath the, the seal itself there'll be a shadow. Those are just ambiently occluded shadows. And since wax is fairly reflective and shiny, because uh, it's oil, um, it's uh, it's kind of nice to uh, just give it that kind of sheen, that high specular highlight. Now for some crackling electricity. So I think this is just sort of like a light blue, uh, and then it's given an outer glow effect, which is a layer effect. So in order to do the blur, I did a, or the gun barrel spinning, I did a motion blur. I duplicated the layer, I did a motion blur, I then painted out some parts of the motion blur, uh, but kept others. And uh, I think I then went back and I had just some kind of little swirly details by hand, like that, yep. Uh, the bolt shells, or the assault cannon shells, I have a custom brush I've made for that just to get that sort of cylindrical shape. But once that's laid down, they still need to be highlighted. 
So that's just the same way I render any cylinder. You know, highlight, terminator, bounce. Adding some details to the knee pad because Space Marines like to bling out everything <laughs> they wear. And just adding some details to help break up those big shapes, a little bit of contrast, as we've covered before. All right, so we got some good-looking Terminators. I think actually at this point in the painting, I started having problems with memory. My computer started running really slowly because the image was so large and there was so much detail and stuff going on. Um, some of the manipulations I were doing, I was doing, required a lot of memory. Um, I think that becomes apparent when I start throwing in the Necron icons in the back. Here I'm doing some uh, little gold decorations for their backs. In this case, a griffin. And it's the same way I would do it any other way. Just highlight, terminator, bounce. Just try to think about where the light source is coming from and rendering it that way. Don't get stuck. Don't trap yourself. It's very easy to get scared and overwhelmed when you're doing metal like this. So what I just did was I merged all my layers and I duplicated them. Uh, I then used a apply color gradient, which gives me that sort of pink, uh, orangey, green color you can see in the layers menu. And I used that to imply sort of, not imply, I'm sorry, to apply extra contrast and color to the uh, different elements of the painting. What I just did was I imported the, actually it's just the, it's the Necron decal sheet from Games Workshop. Just imported that, isolated it, and then using a layer mask, um, painted it in where I needed it to be, like so. And of course, I go in and do a little bit of chip detail and whatnot because it is casting highlights that will, or casting light that will affect other nearby things. So it is important to keep track of that stuff. And as you can see, this image was so large that Photoshop was chunking through. Just adding sort of a hint of a ziggurat in the background. A little bit of muzzle flare. This seems to be a color dodge layer. So I use color dodge for these kind of really, really intense highlights. I'll go in with a layer mask and just sort of knock out areas that I think need to be a little bit stronger. And I, I usually save color dodge to the very end. Um, one thing I'm doing right now is I'm just adding some noise to the face. I found if you render in some noise to skin, it makes it look more like it has pores, a little sort of texture to it that you wouldn't normally have, and that's nice. Uh, just adding some debris to the air, give it sort of a sense of wind and motion. And of course, lightning casts highlights, so or casts light, so there will be highlights around the clouds that the lightning is piercing through, like so. And I actually kind of really enjoy painting clouds. At first, I sort of dreaded them, but now that I've sort of 
I think about them more simply, it helps. That's a uh, curves. These are just sort of brightness and darkness, uh, contrast, hue effects, just to make sure everything's balanced correctly and looks good. Adding the signature and done. So that was a pretty fun painting to do. Um, I hope you learned something from this tutorial. There, I know there's a lot to cover and it's only an hour long. It was, a, I think, a 20 hour, 23 hour painting or something. So it was a little bit quick. But uh, if you have any questions, um, make sure to leave a comment and I'll get back to you with an answer. However, please do watch my FAQ video first. My FAQ video covers a lot of information. Uh, there is a little annotation in the video on YouTube here. So make sure to click on that and follow the link and watch the FAQ first. Because if you do, answer, or if you do ask a question that is covered in the FAQ, I'm not going to answer it because I just can't answer all of those questions which I've already covered in another video. So please do watch that first. Um, I think that's really all I have to say about this one. Uh, if you have any questions about uh, commissioning me, feel free to send me an email at artist at nicholask.com. If you haven't followed me already on Twitter, my Twitter is nicholasmk. Uh, my Facebook is, I believe, nicholaskart. Uh, it's facebook.com slash nicholaskart. And you can find me on Twitch at twitch.tv slash nicholas, uh, I think it's either nicholas.k or nicholas underscore k. Either way, you can find it in the video description. So uh, once again, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll talk to you all soon.